And I would like to uh, thank everyone at SARE for support of this work uh, and to, to share some of the results with you that you can implement in your backyard or on your farm very easily. Um, my son, Yurasvet, who is here, once told me, Daddy, it's strange. People become all upset about some sad news they heard on TV, but nobody seems to be happy about all the wonderful things they never heard about. And this is especially true about honeybees because everyone is talking about pollinators, but many times it is in the negative lights. You hear about bees collapsing and disappearing and becoming sick and being poisoned by pesticides. But uh, I'd like her to do, what I'd like to do today is uh, share the good news with you that you might not have heard about. Uh, and there, even though there are beekeepers who are having trouble keeping their bees alive, there are certainly beekeepers whose bees are thriving and multiplying, and mm, my apiary is are in the second group. And mm, until a hundred years ago, all beekeeping was done naturally. And I would like to share with you some of the key principles that you can apply in any situation. If you go back in history, just 200 years ago, uh, it documents that all farmers had bees in their backyards. It was just part of any homestead. Uh, 200 years ago in Russia, you would read that farmers not only had bees, but also managing these hives didn't uh, distract them from their uh, other agricultural activities. If you were a farmer in 1835, how many hives could you have without them requiring any effort on your part? Three, two, five, wow. But here's the, uh, the complete quote from this book. At that time, farmers commonly, it was not like the biggest or an exceptional apiary, they commonly had a thousand hives in the family, and managing these hives required barely any effort at all to the point that the adults were doing their thing, plowing their fields, etc., and children were in charge of supervising apiaries of uh, 1,000 beehives. Today, people will tell me it's different because we have all the diseases and parasites that plague beekeeping, so this kind of old-style beekeeping is no longer possible. But when I was presenting a two-day natural beekeeping workshop in Montana, they took me hiking into a ridge above Bozeman, Montana, and there are bees living in cracks in rocks uh, in Bozeman. I asked, what time of temperatures do you have in the winters here? They said, Oh, this winter was not too bad. It was just minus 40 for a week, and then it warmed up to minus 30. Uh, here's an evidence that uh, bees, if left on their own, can survive in the harshest of climates found on this continent. So if they're not thriving on your land or in your neck of the woods, that means that something is wrong not with the bees, they can live on their own in the wild, but the way you manage them. Uh, we have a blueberry farm not far from where I live, and I asked the beeky, or the owner how he pollinated the five acres of spray-free blueberry operation. He told me he was paying $1,000 in pollination fees for a beekeeper to bring and put a number of hives on his uh, farm each spring. And when I asked him whether he considered adding a few hives of his own, he said, you know what, I'd rather pay someone $1,000 to do it for me. So how can it be that 100 years ago, people could have hundreds if not thousands of hives, and today even the hives that farmers need for pollination are usually leased from professional beekeepers. Uh, my family has been keeping bees uh, back in Russia since 1972, before I was born. And my uncle, who is the beekeeper in the family, now well in his 70s, almost 80 years old, he just cannot slow down because bees keep multiplying. It's not the problem of her um, keeping her bees alive, it's a problem of having too many bees. And today when someone comes to my uncle and says, we have a huge swarm hanging on our, our apple tree, can you please come and collect it for free? His wife is chasing people away with the broom, saying, leave us alone. We have too many bees as it is. We don't want any more. And he says, well, I'm averaging uh, uh, 50 to 60 pounds per colony, and we have 15 colonies. Uh, that's enough for a family of two. 
So I agree, a thousand pounds of honey every year, that's plenty. Uh, here in Kansas, in Missouri, in the Ozarks, a hundred years ago, you have the books documenting that every household had bees. And they were not in some fancy hives, they were just the log gums or that people would open once a year, scoop out the honeycomb and leave bees alone for another year. Today, many more beekeepers around the world are practicing this style of beekeeping where basically you open your hive just twice a year. In the spring to check whether everything is all right with the colony and then in the fall to harvest your honey. Uh, one of these beekeepers is the Russian author uh, Lazutin, who keeps his bees in a very harsh climate with short window of time for foraging in the summer, but the rest of it is are, you know, completely devoid of any nectar sources, a lot of snow and a lot of cold. He started planting uh, pollinator habitat, hundreds of different species of wildflowers, shrubs and trees, and converted his farm into a pollinator heaven uh, uses horizontal hives with very deep frames, like you can see at my display too. Only propagates his bees in the simplest way of all, by natural swarming. And we'll cover that with you too. Plants are wildflowers for his bees. So in his case, even though the surrounding apiaries are suffering from the colony collapse disorder, he told me his only problem was actually selling all of the honey that he, they were harvesting from their bees. He wrote a book called Keeping Bees with a Smile, and after I read it in the Russian language, I thought, wow, this is the kind of approach that needs to be promoted here. And I served as editor of the English language version of Keeping Bees with a Smile. So if you go back to the very old books, they will tell you there are two important things in natural beekeeping and doing it successfully with just a couple of hive bees per year. One, you need to have local bees and two, you need to put them in a kind of hive that works great in your particular climate and matches your priorities and uh, your interest. The good news about the local bees is that you don't uh, have to buy them from some local beekeeper. Because even local beekeepers who might be selling bees originally got them their stock from someplace else. Mm, they are most popular bee race raised and sold in America is the Italian bee, which is native to the Mediterranean part in Europe. And there, it's great for subtropical climates and south of America, but when you try raising Italian bees there in Kansas or further north, you probably won't be nearly as successful because this bee is not window hardy at all. So many beekeepers lose a substantial portion of their hives every winter, and bee breeders think it's a great thing because the same people who lose their bees in the uh, winter come back for more bees in the spring, year in and year out. In this country, beekeeping can become an expensive hobby just because the bees that you get commercially are not matched to your local conditions, your climate and your flower resources. So part of my SARE project was to look at whether we can tap into the local bees resource because there are plentiful bees living in the woods or wherever natural habitat is available, living in the trunks of trees, in uh, uh, cracks in the rocks. And they've been there since uh, they were brought by settlers from Europe. And even today, despite all the difficulties that commercial beekeepers face, these feral bees are out there without any treatments, nobody's using medicine to treat them, uh, nobody's feeding them f sugar in the fall to make sure they have sufficient reserves for the winter, and they are thriving. The good news is that the bees multiply every spring, and the wild colonies, as uh, well as the managed colonies, will raise uh, uh, new queens. The queen is the special bee that lays eggs and produces all the offspring in the colony. So there is a new queen in a big cell called the queen cell. And when the new queen is almost ready to emerge from the cell, the mother queen takes half of the bees from the colony and they fly out of the hive or out of the bee tree in the woods and hang somewhere on a branch in what is called a swarm. 
And they send out hundreds of scouts all over the place looking for a new tree hollow to move into. So instead of buying bees, what you can do is put a box like that one on a tree and their bees will move in. Everyone knows that you set up a birdhouse and birds will move in, but for whatever reason, we've forgotten what pioneers knew in this country. You set up a bee house on a tree in the spring and it will be occupied by bees. Uh, I'm having 50% success rate with boxes like that, hung on trees. For every 10 that I set out, I would catch five swarms. And they're in more agricultural areas like yours. The success rate can be even greater because where I am in south central Missouri, I'm surrounded by forests with big trees with their hollows in the trees. So my boxes compete against uh, the real thing for the bees. But if you do not have the old growth forest with big oaks and big cavities inside these trees, bees do not have too much choice. So when they swarm and are looking for a new place to move in, if they find your box, this is as good as it gets. And there are um, other beekeepers who have built similar boxes and are using them report even higher success rates in agricultural areas. Uh, on my website, which is horizontalhive.com, I have free plans for building um, boxes like that. And they can be put together even from some scrap materials that you can get from recycling centers and such. And this is how much I got in the, my first trip to the recycling center with my Toyota Sienna minivan with the rear seats folded down. Everything I had on my lumber shopping list to build hives and swamp traps, uh, I could get there for free. And they were happy that I'm getting it because it meant less work for them turning it all into wood mulch. So you get a uh, box like that built, or you can purchase it and put it on the tree. It already has frames inside there where the bees will start building calm once the colony moves in. And there, uh, it is preferable to set it up on a tree rather than close to the ground because bees are looking for tree hollows which are up in the tree. And also, why? If you were a bee, would you prefer a cavity up in the tree or one closer to the ground? Closer to the ground is better because it's closer to the flowers, no? Raccoons, thank you. Predators. Uh, Winnie the Pooh, if you read Winnie the Pooh, <laughs> there is a ter terrific chapter on uh, the bee tree and Winnie the Pooh trying to steal some honey from the bees. And when he was climbing up this pine tree, he was saying, it's a very funny thought that if bears were bees, we'd build our nests at the bottom of trees. And that being so, if the bees were bears, we wouldn't have to climb up all these stairs. So true, Winnie the Pooh knows that, you know, the higher it is on the tree, the more difficult it is for him to get to the honey. And there, if you mimic this, if you put the box where bees would naturally be looking for a cavity, the chances of them occupying it are greater. Uh, there was research done uh, internationally on placing boxes like that on the ground, 10 feet up, 20 feet up in the tree, and they determined that placing it 12 or 15 feet off the ground uh, attracts swarms much more than uh, placing it closer to the ground. Then, uh, uh, one of the elements of attracting the swarms is giving the box the right size, but this box is already the right size, because they don't like too small of a box. Uh, there is not enough room to store enough honey to last the winter. They do not like too big of a box because uh, it's too difficult to heat in the winter. And there, it was shown by research again, by giving bees boxes of different sizes, that they prefer something between 10 and 15 gallons is in size. So this is about 10 gallons. Uh, another aspect that they check is how it smells inside. It's almost like you coming and checking out a new apartment, and if it smells moldy, it's not really appealing. So you need to scent it so that when the scout bees discover the box, it smells like a beehive. 
Uh, two ingredients to that, verified by research, include propolis, which is the bee resin that bees are collect and they're used for sealing cracks inside their home. And I'll pass around one packet so you can smell it. And another one is lemongrass essential oil in slow release vials, which mimics their own pheromone that they release when they find their, uh, their optimal uh, spot for their new swamp trap uh, from their own uh, cavity nest. Uh, also, I wanted to know that if what I'm present on is of interest to you, I invite you to join my email list on horizontalhive.com. Uh, on natural beekeeping. I only send about two or three newsletters per year and they're li limited to um, very important, interesting things or uh, new books coming out or uh, workshops and other things like that. And you can ups unsubscribe at any time. So you can put your email if you would like to be added and you can unsubscribe later at any time. So uh, when uh, I set out the first boxes, my wife was concerned that, you know, it works in Russia, but will it work here in the Ozarks? Maybe bees are different here. So she was encouraging me to buy some bees to start with, but I now am at uh, 36 hives and I never bought a single bee because they just keep coming and coming and coming. A couple of weeks later, after you set it up in the spring, um, the swarming season in Missouri is uh, May and June primarily. Here it would be second half of May, June, and maybe the beginning of July. But bees kept flying and swarms keep flying until as late as late September. So throughout the whole flowering season you can catch a swarm. Um, so there was one box occupied and when it is you just climb up at dark uh, in, in the evening after all foragers return to the box so you don't lose any of them. You cover the entrance and bring it back to your apiary or, or to your place where you transfer them into a bigger box, which will be their permanent hive. And then you take an empty box and put it back on the tree again. So there was uh, one swamp trap occupied and then another and then another. Like this summer I caught 22 swarms. Consider that the cost of uh, uh, two pounds of bees is $120. The average size of my swarms is five pounds of bees. And I caught 22 of them. So I uh, caught like 100 uh, plus uh, pounds of bees valued at $50 a pound. So just $5,000 in bees alone. But not only the quantity is greater and they come for free, the quality is uh, um, very different. And this is what I was looking at as part of the SARE research. Um, the statistic shows that when you buy commercial bees in the state of Missouri, half of all hives will die in the first year. So you, you lose half of your investment in the first year. With the feral bees, because they were honed by natural selection, the weakest ones died and the strongest ones kept reproducing, improving their genetics from one year to the next. So the local feral bees keep living for years and years. Of the colonies that I caught in swamp traps uh, in 2013, 80% of them are still going today, four years later. So the survival rate of the feral bees that I caught as part of this research is 90% per year as opposed to 50% for commercial bees. And then another thing I love about bees, you never know what will happen next. Once I saw that there were bees in and out of the box, I went in the evening to collect the box and there was a second swarm that arrived and landed on this uh, box. So I saw the spectacle of them deciding whether to go inside and merge with the existing colony or to fly off. Took me three, year, uh, three hours to watch them, you know, making the decision. Uh, and it was the 4th of July and the fireworks were going off at the distance and people who were driving on the highway were, you know, blowing their horns looking at the guy who is up on the ladder and celebrated the 4th of July so hard that he is just stuck there looking at the box. It was a lot of fun. So uh, the box when you set on the tree needs to be highly visible. 
If you cannot see it from 300 feet away, the bees will have trouble finding it too. So don't put it between the branches of a red cedar tree or another tree that has very developed uh, branches low to the ground. Like oak trees or other trees with exposed trunk, the first you know, 15 feet um, work uh, much better. Uh, also, bees see the forking shapes very well. So the trees that are big in diameter with big limbs coming off them or forks in the leaf uh, uh, in the trunk uh, work real well. Also, bees like using our highways and power lines for their own purposes and navigation. For a bee flying through the thick of the forest of vegetation, it's very difficult because she needs to fly fast and not to bump in, into any branches or obstacles. For this reason, if there is open area, they would fly along the highway or along the power line to get from where they need to go to back to their hive. This is why the trees that are on the edge of the woods, on the edge of the woods by the power line, in fence rows, along highways, in backyards, in front yards, in parks, anywhere where the tree stands out, they work much better attracting swarms than trees in the middle of the woods. And it doesn't even have to be a tree. If you are not into climbing on a tree, and by the way, you can set the swamp trap up into the tree by just tossing a rope over a branch, tying it to your trap and raising it like that, uh, so it can be done safely. But you can also put it on the roof of your garage or, uh, or somewhere place else. Just keep the box well shaded so it doesn't overheat. Uh, this tree, uh, not far from where I live, I call the I'll be darn tree. When I was hanging the swamp trap, a red pickup truck stops in the highway. The farmer rolls down the window and asks, what the heck are you doing there? And I'm always nervous when people stop while I'm hanging my swan traps and ask this question because uh, it could be the owner of the land I'm setting it on. I always take care to put it on a tree that is outside the fence line, if there is any. But still some people you know, feel particular about somebody setting God, goodness knows what on a tree close to their land. And regularly I would have swamp traps that are shot at, you come and it's riddled with bullets. Sometimes people shoot at swamp traps when the bees are already inside and unfortunately I lost a few colonies this way too. So starting this season I write something nice on the box. Uh, I can report that when I write the number of the SARE grant on it, saying USDA SARE grant, da, 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 nobody touches that. <laughs> Uh, so this alone was a huge bonus. Uh, also, if you write something nice about children, uh, like Bees for Children Community Project or Saving Local Bees, uh, these boxes never got touched, so uh, it's a good practice. So this gentleman stops and says, what the heck are you doing there? I said, uh, almost dropped from the ladder, saying, oh, I'm hanging a box. To do what? Well, to attract some honeybees. You must be kidding. Yes, they, they can move into this box. I'll be darned, and he drove off. But the funniest part came three weeks later. I'm on the same extension ladder, on the same tree on the side of the road, taking down a box like that full of honeybees. It was a huge swarm, like seven and a half pounds. Uh, a red pickup truck stops in the highway. The same gentleman rolls down the window and says, and what the heck are you doing there again? I said, well, I'm taking down a box full of honeybees. I'll be darned. <laughs> Okay, you don't know, need to know where the bee tree is that produces the swarm because the scouts from the swarm can travel for miles looking for the right location. But if you happen to know where the bee tree is, if you have a bee tree in your yard or if bees live in your home uh, in, in the wall, don't put it straight close by because just as humans like moving away from their mothers and fathers when they grow up, the swarms like moving away from their parent colony so as not to compete for the same flowers. So they spread through the landscape. And their research showed that if you, like I did, strap your swamp trap to the bee tree, it will never be occupied. But if you hang it 300 feet away, then it will have a very good chance of bees moving into it. So you bring it back home. There are already frames in the box that match the size of the frames in your bigger hive. You transfer them into your bigger hive and you put this empty swamp trap with a new set of empty frames 
back on the tree because you can catch two, three swarms on the same tree in the same season. Uh, my uh, record is three swarms on the same tree. Uh, just because a single colony living in the woods may cast three swarms or so. So if you caught one, it could be that they will be issuing another swarm within a couple of days or within a week. So we covered the first part very quickly. Where to get local bees? You can get a plenty by catching uh, uh, local swarms. How to estimate whether your chances are good or not? If you see honeybees visiting flowers where you are, that means you have a good chance of catching a swarm. Of course, if you live in a place where for miles and miles around there is absolutely no flowering vegetation, like only fescue fields or only corn, Actually, corn and soybeans can be good sources of nectar and pollen too. But if there is absolutely nothing for bees to eat for miles and around, if you do not see bees around, then this would not be a very good place to put your swamp traps. But if you have some clover, saint foy, and alfalfa in bloom, and you see bees on that, you can catch bees quite reliably in these locations. Uh, just very briefly, I'll cover it in the second topic of what to do next. Um, and there uh, we can talk more at my table after that. But basically, the American hive model that is most widely used, called the Langstroth hive, um, represents uh, a series of boxes that are stacked one on top of the other. And uh, it requires uh, quite a bit of experience for managing it properly. Uh, not only that, but it can physically be challenging because when you need to handle a box like that and it is full of honey, the box can weigh 50 to 60 pounds and you're supposed to handle it in a position like that. One of my friend beekeepers, a commercial beekeeper from Michigan, joked that uh, all the money he had made on selling honey in his career of a commercial beekeeper, he then had to spend on uh, hip replacements and knee surgeries and back surgeries after he was 65. And it was a very sad joke because he was speaking from his own experience. And I know that it in discourages many people from getting into beekeeping the prospect of handling all these super heavy boxes of fur honey. Uh, fortunately, there is another system of beekeeping that was traditionally widely used there in uh, Europe. Uh, and this is called uh, horizontal hives. Uh, in the horizontal hive, all the um, frames are on the same level. And it has the benefit of saving you the trouble of lifting anything. You lift just one frame at a time. You can have access to all the frames at once. So if you need to get to the lowest box to check something, you don't have to disassemble all the stack and then do it and then reassemble the stack again. You can get exactly to the frame you need um, and there, do it with minimal intervention for the bees too. Another benefit of horizontal hives was the observation of, Amer of European beekeepers that they produce basically the same amount of honey as the vertical hive, uh, but with a very small amount of effort. Here is a quote from the French beekeeper who was one of the most well-known beekeepers in his time, who documented that in apiaries where he only opened his beehives once a year, he always had these horizontal hives in excellent shape and they're full of honey, extracting which was his only task. So he describes he would come there in September, open the lid of this long hive, pull out the frames with honey, spin them out in a centrifuge extractor, uh, take the empty frames, put them back into the hive on the same day, close the cover and leave the bees alone for a whole year. Today, beekeepers who have any experience in this country don't even believe such style of beekeeping is possible. Uh, so I decided to test it. Uh, what will happen if you use this all-time approach of putting bees in the box and doing nothing for a year or two years? Will they die? No, my experience and their, the two years air uh, grant project to verify that, that the bees will be there. There will be just a little bit of mortality, but it is natural in both managed and uh, wild their bees. But uh, they keep going and going and going, being productive and multiplying. 
So I put a small swarm that I caught in June in a, um, two or three years back in a box and it did nothing. I didn't feed them, I didn't give them any treatments. I do not treat my bees with any chemicals or not even with organic uh, uh, pest control methods at all, ever. And uh, I opened the box one year later and this is what I saw. The whole box was filled with honeycomb up to 16 inches deep. There was plenty full of bees and their brood, the young bees in development. And look at all this capped honey that was still in the hive after the year was over and the winter was over. So this was the, the spring of year two after they got installed. So there were more and more frames like that in the small colony that persuaded me and I was able to verify on three dozen of my hives that yes, it is still possible to manage your bees in this old style fashion when you don't touch your bees at all almost other than when you need to harvest honey. Now, people will object here that uh, this, this way you are not maximizing your honey production per colony. And I will agree with that. But if you add up all the expenses of managing your bees, looking into a hive every two weeks as the beekeeping manuals prescribe, uh, all the more expensive equipment you need to use, using fungicides and uh, chemicals and antibiotics, FDA made, took samples of honey sold in America. More than 99% of honeys in supermarkets uh, had antibiotics in them, just because this is the residue from what the beekeepers put into their own beehives. So if you add up all this expense, and you will spend a small fortune on chemicals if you want going this way, your own time, the mortality of your honey bee colonies, then you will see that the increase in honey production per hive actually comes at a huge cost. My approach is to let the bees live their natural life, don't contaminate the honey with any chemicals at all, and have a product which probably in terms of quantity will be smaller than that of big commercial beekeepers, but the quality is such that the going rate for mass-produced honey is two pounds or uh, uh, $2 a pound when they sell it in big 55 gallon drums. I'm able to sell all of my crop at uh, $20 a pound and I always sell out just because real honey that is free from any chemicals and free from any sugar, I never feed my bees sugar and this is one other advantage of horizontal hives, uh, they are structured in such a way that the bees first fill their half of the hive with their winter reserves and then produce surplus that's stocked in the other back of the hive. So when I remove this surplus, I'm sure that the bees have already uh, mm, stockpiled all the reserves they need for the winter, so I never have to feed them sugar water going into winter. And uh, this is why, by the way, I do not certify my bees as certified organic, even though I could, because certified organic honey allows the beekeeper to feed bees sugar as long as the sugar is organic. So I don't want to degrade the quality of my product to these, uh, uh, you know, practice of converting uh, sugar water or corn syrup into honey because I do not feel this is really honey from, uh, doesn't deserve the name. Okay, just a few more words on uh, horizontal hives. Because there are no additional boxes for the bees to move into, you can make the top bars of your frames touching. This way, there is no crack between, and when you open the hive, you are not exposing any bees. It's not like there is a swarm of angry bees coming at you because you disturb them. You are able to do what you need to do on the side of the existing frames, adding more frames for honey storage, or pulling frames full of honey at the end of the year. Uh, you can also produce propolis by putting on top of the frames are, uh, plastic sheets with incisions there and the bees will put their glue that you smelled and their, this product is highly sought after. Conventional propolis goes for $65 a pound. Uh, the one produced by the hives are, that were not treated with any chemicals goes for $100 a pound. So it is just another thing you can produce from your bees. Uh, there was a question there? Yeah, what was the white, uh, you had a white sheet there in the picture and then, and then covering, what, what's the purpose of that? 
Yeah, this is just, if you use conventional American frames, this hive uses the American frames that have a gap between the top bars. So to prevent the bees and from being exposed when you open the box, you can cover it with a piece of canvas. Uh, but I give preference to the European style frames that do not have any gaps there because this way you open the box of bees and there is zero disturbance for them and zero stress for you handling them. Yes? How difficult is it to get these style frames from our traditional beekeeping supply companies? Uh, they do not carry this style of uh, hives. I have free plans for building them uh, on horizontalhive.com. I also sell them. Uh, the equipment I have here is for sale too. So if you are not a woodworker, you can purchase it from horizontalhive.com. Including the frames. You make Including the frames. I, I make all the frames. So uh, this is the standard used in Europe called the lens. Uh, to give you an idea, in all of America, there are 2.6 million hives. In just one country in Europe, Spain, which is smaller than the state of Texas, there are more than 1 million hives just using this frame alone. So it is a very widely used and respected frame. And the beekeepers would, in Europe would not trade it for any other hive model because of the ad, some of the advantages that we are covering. Now, okay, then when you have a hive that is just one box, you can insulate it properly. Um, the stacked hive boxes, you don't want to insulate because this would add to the weight of the box even further. Instead of being 60 pounds, it will be 68 pounds. But because this is a stationary hive that doesn't go anywhere, you can insulate it. And the insulation materials for all my hives, I can get for free too from the local sheep breeders who breed their animals for meat, and the quality of the wool is not high enough to be marketable, so they make huge piles of it and burn it in the spring. So I can get it by the truckload for free. And uh, wherever I present it, if you have local sheep breeders, you probably can get a lot of uh, wool for insulating your hives for free too. And uh, interestingly, insulating your hives is extremely important, not only where you have very cold winters, but also where you have very hot summers. Because if you don't insulate your hives properly, this picture is of a double wall hive with insulation between the walls, uh, then on a hot summer day, most of the bees, instead of gathering honey, will be clustering outside the hive because it's just too warm for them to do any work inside. Finally, with the very deeper uh, frames that mimic the deep structure of a tree hollow in a natural bee nest in the wild, you are avoiding any danger of bees are, uh, losing contact with honey in the winter and dying from starvation. The farther north you go, the more this problem uh, becomes acute. Uh, the American frames are just nine inches deep, so to go from one frame of honey to the next, the bees have to bridge a gap of about one inch. but. Uh, uh, and if they're very hibernated and slow because of the cold, they may die of starvation in the lower box of your hive, even though there is additional honey up top. They just do not know it's up there because they're too uh, sluggish. In the European style frame, the honey is here, the bees are here. They're able to move the whole winter up consuming honey and preheating honey with their own breath um, without losing touch of honey, without any risk of them starving to death. Uh, so, there is additional information in the book called Keeping Bees with a Smile that I'm the editor of. And there uh, additional information on horizontalhive.com. Here are some of the pictures of some of my hives and some of the frames and the bees. Uh, free plans on horizontalhive.com. Uh, if you are not comfortable working with power tools, you can make a hive building party. This is what we built or did where I live. We had 17 people coming together, bringing their own tools and skills. At the end of the day, we had 33 boxes like that built and 17 horizontal hives built at the cost of materials. So it doesn't have to become expensive. One of my friends said, my mother spent $5,000 on her beekeeping hobby in the last five years. 
you know, buying all these hives and then buying bees that they have to renew every year because they just do not endure our winters. Your experience can be different. Yaroswet once told me, Daddy, I had a dream about one billion bee colonies. And because nobody sprayed them with pesticide, not a single bee died and they collected so much honey that it lasted them one billion years. Uh, and there, you know, here in the Midwest, we have amazing local plants that produce fabulous honey and fabulous nectar. Uh, here is button bush that grows wherever standing water is available. Uh, uh, blazing star and basswood and their red buds. And this is my number one best producing plant, which is sumac. I know farmers try to get rid of sumac because it spreads and it just, you know, ruins your pasture. But this is where my honey comes from. And I bet I can get more in terms of even economic return from an acre of sumac on rocky southern exposure, unproductive soil than I could get from the same acreage by running cattle there. Uh, there is more information on Keeping Bees with a Smile as well as uh, in two other books in the same series that I edited uh, in the English translation of um, Growing Vegetables with a Smile and Growing Fruit with a Smile. They are as revolutionary in their respective areas as Keeping Bees with a Smile is regarding bees. Do you know about these so-called sun hives that a German yes. researcher came up with? You hang them in a tree, and they're really just for habitat. You don't extract any honey. It's really just so that bees can swarm and... Thank you for your question. It's true, you know, that if you, your primary interest is pollination, then you don't need even to have a box like that with frames in it. You can create any kind of cavity that is, as we know from research, from 10 to 15 gallons. And, you know, hollow logs will work great and just put it up on the tree and it will attract bees and it can stay there. If you are not getting any honey from there, it will be there just for pollinating. But it's true that in many areas, including here, habitat may be the limiting factor for the bees. They may have plentiful forage, but there are not sufficient trees with big hollows inside them to allow the big population of local bees to be present. Uh, so if you provide this habitat, as they do in Germany and elsewhere, and if your primary interest in pollination, you can uh, do it at even small expense. However, I see no reason not to keep bees for both pollination and honey, because if you do it uh, using the natural methods and that are bee-friendly and non-invasive, uh, you can do all the pollination you want without compromising the health and the vitality of your colony and get honey almost as a byproduct of what you do for boosting pollinator uh, populations.